Shalom to the Lord's beautiful honeybees. Welcome to Hebrew Scripture Study. My name is Mrs. Sharon, and I'm so glad that you could join us today for this study. Due to a lack of time, we're skipping the usual introduction, which is available on previous videos, so that we could dive straight into this week's study. Some of this information may be difficult to hear, but ultimately I pray it is a blessing and an edification to you, and may the Lord be glorified. This week's study revolves around a distinct word from Shemini, this week's Torah portion. That word in Hebrew is, this is what it looks like, the tet, a mem, and an olive. It's pronounced tamay, and it is most often used to mean unclean. Because it means so much more and is relevant for us today, I would like us to look at the word Tameh in a totally new way to relate it to the teachings of our Messiah Yeshua and all of the writings of the Brit Hadashah, Renewed Covenant, which, as we know, do not contradict any of the other scriptures of the Bible. The Hebrew word Tameh appears 17 times in the Shemini Torah portion and 114 times in the Tanakh, which is the Torah, Prophets, and Writings. On the other hand, depending on the version you use, the English word unclean can appear about 33 times in this portion alone, for a grand total of approximately 197 times in the Tanakh and 44 times in the Brit Hadashah. Why is there such a discrepancy? To illustrate the difference, before it first appears in Leviticus, the English word unclean appears two other times in the scriptures, in the book of Genesis, when the Lord was giving Noah the instructions of which animals were to go into the ark. Genesis 7-2 You shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, two each of animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Genesis 7-8 Of clean animals, of animals that are unclean, of birds, and of everything that creeps on the earth. The word translates unclean in those passages are actually two separate Hebrew words, lo tahara, meaning not clean, and it's not the word tameh, which is unclean. The Hebrew word tahor is most often used to mean clean. After the flood, the Lord said, in Genesis 9-3, Every moving thing that lives shall be food for you. I have given you all things, even as the green herbs. If God only wanted his people to eat tahor, clean foods, why would he say to Noah, every moving thing shall be food? Food for thought. After the flood, Noah and his wife and sons were the only living human beings on the whole face of the earth. Their descendants, which include Canaan, Mitzrayim, or Egypt, etc., would become all of the nations of the world. But one day, the nation that would spring from the children of Shem, Israel in particular, would eventually become his set-apart people who would eat differently. This study will delve slightly into the topic of kosher. Without giving many details right now, kosher is a Hebrew word meaning proper and is a system that creates sort of fence laws around all aspects of food preparation and consumption based on rabbinic interpretations of scripture. Attempting to follow kashrut at time can get very complicated and restrictive, but no harm and even many benefits can come from attempting to follow kosher food laws unless they contradict scripture, as you will see later. Sometimes in this study, when the word kosher is used, we will take it to mean biblically tahor, or clean. But please be aware that the two words do not mean the same thing in their common everyday usage. Further along in Genesis, the Hebrew word tameh appears in a different context, this time in the incident of Dinah. Details will be omitted in order to be sensitive to younger viewers. Genesis 34, 5 And Jacob heard that Shechem had tameh, Dinah his daughter. In this second context, tameh means defiled, which means being made unclean because of some unholy act. So, throughout the Bible, the word unclean is not always the word tameh and vice versa. So, for the purposes of this study, we will be using the word tameh and, even though we do not have that word in the Renewed Covenant because we only have Greek manuscripts, because the writers of the Gospels and letters wrote in Hebraic thinking, we will be bringing the word tameh into the Renewed Covenant as well to hopefully get a more well-rounded picture and fit everything together. The Hebrew word tameh as it relates to unclean animals does not appear until Leviticus chapter Chapter 5, when the Lord is giving Moses the instructions about what happens if someone touches an unclean thing. Leviticus 5.2 If a person touches any unclean thing, whether it is the carcass of an unclean beast, or the carcass of unclean livestock, or the carcass of unclean creeping things, and he is unaware of it, he also shall be unclean and guilty. As we can notice in scripture, only in its dead state does a tamay or unclean animal become tamay defiling for us. It appears that somehow the impurity of that creature passes to us through its death if we come in contact with its carcass or dead body through our flesh or hopefully not with our mouths. Some people say that Yeshua made all foods clean. We will be discussing those passages a bit later. But first I would like to discuss
us the option of believing that the creatures the Lord declared to me should not be eaten by us even now. Of course, it is up to each person to decide for themselves what the Lord would have them to do. But I would like to propose that if we are in God's covenant with Israel, which we are if we are in Messiah Yeshua, food should only be what the Lord says is food for us. The most widely consumed tame or unclean group of animals is swine, also known as pigs, hogs, boars, etc. The culinary name being pork, from which is made things like ham, bacon, pork chops, lard, most sausages, pepperoni, chorizo, etc. And even some products like meatballs that are labeled as chicken or beef may have pork. Leviticus 11, 7 through 8. And the swine, though it divides the hoof, having cloven hooves, yet does not chew the cud, is unclean to you. Their flesh you shall not eat, and their carcasses you shall not touch. They are unclean to you. Other Tamei animals include land animals that do not chew the cud and part the hoof, canines such as coyote, dog, fox, hyena, jackal, wolf, etc., felines such as cat, cheetah, leopard, lion, panther, tiger, etc., equines such as donkey, horse, mule, onager, zebra, etc. Other mammals such as armadillo, badger, bear, beaver, camel, elephant, gorilla, hippopotamus, kangaroo, llama, alpaca, and vicuña, monkey, rabbit, raccoon, rhinoceros, skunk, wallaby, weasel, wolverine, etc. Rodents such as groundhog, mole, mouse, muskrat, opossum, porcupine, rat, squirrel, etc. Reptiles such as large lizard, gecko, monitor lizard, sand reptile, sand lizard, chameleon, etc. That's in Leviticus 11, 3 through 8, 29 to 31. Perhaps even more severe than Tame is a category of creatures called shakets, which are actually listed as abomination and detestable. Leviticus 11, 10 through 11. All in the seas or in the rivers that do not have fins and scales, all that move in the water or any living thing which is in the water, they are shakets, an abomination to you. They shall be an abomination to you. You shall not eat their flesh, but you shall regard their carcasses as an abomination. Some shakets creatures include marine animals without fins and scales, fish such as bullhead, catfish, eel, European turbot, marlin, paddlefish, shark, stickleback, sturgeon, includes most caviar, and swordfish, shellfish such as abalone, clam, conch, crab, crayfish, crawfish and crawdad, lobster, mussel, oyster, scallop, shrimp, also known as prawn, soft body, cuttlefish, jellyfish, limpet, octopus, squid, also known as calamari, sea mammals, such as dolphin, otter, porpoise, seal, walrus, and whale. Leviticus 11, 9-12. More shakets creatures include birds of prey, carrion, flying mammals, etc. Albatross, bat, bittern, buzzard, condor, coot, cormoran, crane, crow, cuckoo, eagle, flamingo, grebe, grosbeak, gull, hawk, heron, kite, lapwing, loon, magpie, osprey, ostrich, owl, parrot, pelican, penguin, plover, rail, raven, roadrunner, sandpiper, seagull, stork, swallow, swift, vulture, water hen, woodpecker, etc. Leviticus 11, 13 to 19. Some more shakets creatures include creeping, crawling, swarming creatures, etc. All insects without joined, jumping legs, ants, roaches, beetles, etc. Locusts, some grasshoppers, and some crickets are tahor or clean. Arachnids, such as spiders and scorpions, etc. All flying insects that creep on all fours, some grasshoppers, crickets, and all mantids, for example, praying mantis. Whatever crawls on its belly, whatever goes on all fours, or whatever has many feet, such as snakes, amphibians, like frogs, slugs, snails, also known as escargot, worms, centipedes, millipedes, etc. That's in Leviticus 11, 20 to 23 and 41 to 43. Leviticus 20, 25 to 26. You shall therefore distinguish between clean animals and unclean, between unclean birds and clean, and you shall not make yourselves abominable by beasts or by bird or by any kind of living thing that creeps on the ground, which I have separated from you as unclean. And you shall be holy to me, for I the Lord am holy, and have separated you from the peoples, that you should be mine. Aside from spiritual reasons, there may be another reason the Lord doesn't want us to eat Tamei and Shaket's creatures. In all reality, most of them are the waste disposals of the animal world. All of the dirty, moldy scraps of old food, dead rotting animal flesh, feces, and other potentially toxic waste materials that this animal eats become part of the animal and no amount of cleaning can remove it because like we say, you are what you eat. We would not eat a bag of garbage, would we? If we really think about it in essence, if we eat these creatures, that is what we are eating. Furthermore, another reason the Lord may have chosen or rather created certain animals to be tahor, clean, and others to be tamay or unclean for our consumption, especially the land animals, is because the Lord is 
is compassionate and he doesn't want them suffering as they die, especially if it is for feeding us. As the video you will see shows, there is no humane way to kill a Tamay animal. Another interesting thing that Hashem said about the animals, about kosher animals, that we didn't talk about in the last year, is that He wanted us to identify the kosher animal from the outside because that's easy for us to, to know, easy for us to identify. But there's also internal signs inside the animals. Now, according to Judaism, in order for an animal to be allowed for us, to be permitted for us to eat them, they have to be slaughtered in a kosher way. A slaughtered in a kosher way means that the animal cannot suffer, even for one second. Now if you look at a slaughter from the outside and you're not familiar with slaughtering, it, slaughtering looks really horrendous. It doesn't look like it's not painful, but there's actually scientific proof that it's not painful. All of the non-kosher animals, including mankind, have all of the blood at some point travels from the heart to the brain. Now someone is considered alive as long as there's blood going to the brain. As soon as the blood stops going to the brain, you're considered dead. It's not if the blood stops going to the heart. That's just a heart attack and Bezod Hashem somebody gets back. But as soon as there's no longer any more blood going to the brain, you're considered clinically dead. So now, as soon as we disconnect the blood from the brain of the animal, the animal is officially dead, meaning that it's no longer functioning, it's, it dies within a matter of less than a second. Now all of the animals have two veins that connect to the brain, on the bottom of their neck and on the top of their neck, which means that regardless, of, let's say for example, if this is the head of a horse, that means that there will be a vein on the bottom and a vein on the top. Even if we cut the vein, if we slaughter it on the bottom, there's still going to be blood coming from the top. Which means that until all the blood comes out of the bottom, he's still going to be alive and he's still going to suffer. He's going to, he's going to feel the pain because he's still alive. There's still blood going to the brain from the top. So this means that there's no clean way to slaughter a horse or a camel or so on. But if you look at the kosher animals, if you look at the cow, you look at the lamb, you look at the ones that were allowed to eat, the deer. There's only a few animals. There's a very unique thing about their creation. They also have two veins. But right before they get to the brain, both of the veins connect and become a single vein. Which means that when the rabbi slaughters the animal, he's only cutting one vein. And by the time the remaining blood goes from the end of the vein to where you cut to the uh, brain, the animal is already dead. Which means that scientifically, it has never felt pain. If the animal feels pain, it's no longer kosher. So again, this is something that we wouldn't have known 3,300 years ago, unless God told us. The third way that the word Tamei appears in scripture, beginning in Leviticus 12 to 14, is when a priest found that someone had Sara'at, incorrectly translated as leprosy, or some other uncleanness. That person would then be declared Tamei, or unclean, by the priest. Leviticus 13.45 Now the leper on whom the sore is, his clothes shall be torn, and his head bare, and he shall cover his upper lip, and cry, Tamei, Tamei unclean, unclean. Then, according to Leviticus 14, 1 to 32, when the leper was healed, he must be reinspected by the priest. There must be atonement through the death of a clean animal, an anointing with oil, and multiple shavings and washings of the body and all clothing. After all of that, the person was considered cleansed and pronounced tahor, or clean, and then he or she was allowed to enter the camp again. This happened to Moses' sister Miriam. See Numbers 12, 10 to 15. Many times in the Renewed Covenant, when Yeshua healed someone with leprosy, it's says that they were cleansed or made clean, and he told them to do the ritual cleansing that was prescribed in the scriptures. In one instance in particular, a leper came and worshipped Yeshua, saying, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean, or tahor. 
Then Yeshua put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing, be cleansed. Immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Yeshua said to him, See that you tell no one, but go your way, show yourself to the priests, and offer the gift that Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Matthew 8, 2-4 Now we come to Acts chapter 10, where Peter went on a rooftop to pray, and he was hungry. As they made the food ready, he fell into a trance. We will begin at verse 11. Peter saw heaven opened, and an object like a great sheet bound at the four corners, descending to him and let down to the earth. In it were all kinds of four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, creeping things, and birds of the air. And a voice came to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. At this point we can stop for a moment to address the fact that many people use that verse we just read to mean that God was saying that Peter could now eat all of the creatures on that sheet, of which many were most certainly to make. Or unclean, thus in their opinion nullifying God's own food laws. Let's read on to see what happened. But Peter said, Not so, Lord, for I have never eaten anything common or unclean or tame. And a voice spoke to him again the second time, What God has cleansed you must not call common. This was done three times, and the object was taken up into heaven again. Now Peter wondered, was perplexed within himself, what this vision which he had seen meant. See, Peter knew that the vision wasn't what it seemed to be at first glance. He knew it was supposed to symbolize something else, and at the time he wasn't yet aware of what God meant the vision to symbolize. Let's keep reading. Skipping down to Acts 10.28, Peter told those in Cornelius' house, You know it is against our laws, not God's laws, for a Jewish man to enter a Gentile home like this or to associate with you. But God has shown me that I should no longer think of anyone, any person, not any creature, as impure or to me unclean. A person who is tahor, clean and undefiled, can become tame, unclean and defiled through an unholy act like sin or other impurity. A person who is tame, unclean and defiled can become tahor, clean and undefiled through ritual purification or cleansing. As was the case with the lepers in Leviticus, Cornelius and those of his household were inspected by the Lord and found to be tahor or clean because of their prayers, alms and obedience, which were their acts of purification. Then by the preaching of Peter, the water of the word, they were cleansed. And because Yeshua, the Lamb of God, a clean animal, was sacrificed for them, and as the high priest, he also declared them tahor, clean. After after all that, Cornelius and his family received the Holy Spirit, which is the anointing oil, verse 44, and they were also baptized, their bodies washed with water, verse 47. Then they were permitted to enter the camp of God's set-apart people, the children of Israel. 2 Corinthians 7, 1b, Let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Leviticus 11:32. Anything on which any tame animal falls, when they are dead, shall be unclean, whether it is any item of wood or clothing or skin or sack. Whatever item it is in which any work is done, it must be put in water, and it shall be unclean until evening, then it shall be clean. As with the vessels from the previous verse, 2 Timothy 2, 20-21, in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. Hebrews 9, 13-14 For if the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of a heifer, sprinkling the unclean, sanctifies for the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without spot to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? James 4, 8 Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. 2 Peter 1, 8-9 For if faith, virtue, knowledge, self-control, perseverance, godliness, brotherly kindness, love, are yours and abound, you will be neither barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For he who lacks these things is short-sighted, even to blindness, and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. 1 John 1, 7 If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. 1 John 1, 9 If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Now we will see two articles from the United Church of God that address the question of whether Yeshua abrogated or annulled the Lord's food laws or not. Some of the terminology in it, like Old and New Testament, we prefer Tanakh and Renewed Covenant, as well as others, are not what we would use, but much of the information is helpful and may answer many questions perhaps you have had regarding this topic. The Surprise Sayings of Jesus Christ Did Jesus Declare All Meats Clean? Many assume Jesus' statements in Mark 7 did away with the dietary restrictions recorded in the Old Testament. How should we understand Christ's words? In this series of articles, we have examined statements of Jesus Christ 
that when understood correctly are surprisingly different in meaning from the way they are commonly understood. In the case of dietary restrictions recorded in the Bible, the surprise may be the result of understanding not just what Jesus said, but what he did not say in the Gospel of Mark. Many believe that in his encounter with the Pharisees, recorded in Mark 7, 1-23, Jesus abrogated the laws of clean and unclean meat revealed in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. In fact, many modern translations of the New Testament insert additional words into the text of Mark 7, 19 to reflect this understanding. For example, the New International Version ends the verse with, In saying this, Jesus declared all foods clean. The New King James Version has thus purifying all foods and includes the marginal explanation, and you you, an abbreviation for the text used by many New Testament translations, sets off the final phrase as Mark's comment that Jesus has declared all foods clean. But is this textual variation correct? Does it capture the meaning of the passage in question? What exactly did Jesus mean by his statement? Context provides the answer. One of the foundational principles for understanding a scriptural passage is to examine the context. What is the topic of discussion here? We should first notice that the subject is food in general, not which meats are clean or unclean. The the Greek word broma, used in Mark 7.19, simply means food. An entirely different Greek word, kreos, is used in the New Testament where meat, animal flesh, is specifically intended. See Romans 14.21 and 1 Corinthians 13.8. So this passage concerns the general subject of food rather than meat. But a closer look shows that more is involved. The first two verses help us understand the context. Then the Pharisees and some of the scribes came together to him, having come from Jerusalem. Now when they saw some of his disciples eat bread with defile, that is, unwashed hands, they found fault. Mark 7, 1-2 They asked Jesus, Why do your disciples not walk according to the tradition of the elders, but eat bread with unwashed hands? Mark 7, 5 Now we see the subject further clarified. It concerns eating, quote, with unwashed hands, unquote. Why was this of concern to the scribes and Pharisees? The covenant God made with Israel at Mount Sinai was based on many laws and other instruction that ensured ritual purity. Jewish observance, however, often went beyond these in embracing the oral law or tradition of the elders, passed on by word of mouth and consisting of many additional man-made requirements and prohibitions tacked on to God's laws. Mark 7, 3-4 provide a brief explanation of the specific practice the Pharisees and scribes were referring to in this account. Quote, For the Pharisees and all the Jews do not eat unless they wash their hands in a special way, holding the tradition of the elders. Notice that food laws are not in question here. The topic is ritual purity, based on the religious traditions of the oral law. The disciples were being criticized for not following the proper procedure of ceremonial hand washing prescribed by these revered religious traditions. The Jewish New Testament commentary explaining the background of Mark 7 2 4 offers a description of this custom. Mark's explanation of a ritual hand washing in these verses corresponds to the details set forth in Mishnah Tractate Yadayim. The Mishnah is a later written version of the oral tradition. In the marketplace, one may touch ceremonially impure things. The impurity is removed by rinsing up to the wrist. Orthodox Jews today observe ritual hand washing before meals. The rationale for it has nothing to do with hygiene, but is based on the idea that a man's home is his temple, with the dining table his altar, the food his sacrifice, and himself the Kohen or priest. Since the Tanakh or Old Testament requires Kohanim or priests to be ceremonially pure before offering sacrifices on the altar, the Oral Torah requires the same before eating a meal. By the time of Christ, many had made these additional practices a top priority and in doing, sometimes overlooked and even violated the fundamental principles of the law of God, Matthew 23, 1-4, Matthew 23, 23-28, spiritual principle of purification. After decrying the hypocrisy of this and other religious traditions and practices of the day, Jesus gets to the heart of the matter. He explains that what defiles a person in the eyes of God comes not from the outside, by what one puts into his mouth, but from within. In Mark 7:15, he said it is far more important to concentrate on what comes out of your heart than what you put into your mouth. Jesus explains, for from within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, adulteries, fornications, murders, thefts, covetousness, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, and foolishness. All these evil things come from within and defile a man. Some of these same qualities are listed in Galatians 5, 19-21 as works of the flesh. They are contrasted with the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22-23. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control are qualities of a spiritually purified heart. 
The ceremonial washings and purification practices of the Old Covenant were physical representations of the spiritual purification to be offered in the New Covenant. Hebrews 9:11 to 14. Hebrews 9.23 tells us, Therefore it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens, referring to the tabernacle, altars, priests, etc., should be purified with these ceremonial purifications, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these. So the Apostle Paul writes that Jesus gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from every lawless deed and purify for himself his own special people, zealous for good works. Titus 2.14 Blessed are the pure in heart is one of the fundamental teachings of Christ. Matthew 5.8 Unwashed hands don't defile the heart. In Mark 7, Jesus explains that ceremonial washing is not necessary for spiritual purity or sound spiritual health. He points out that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him, because it does not enter his heart but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Mark 7, 18-19 Jesus is simply stating here that any dirt or other incidental impurities not removed through elaborate hand washing will be purged out by the human digestive system in a manner that has no bearing on the heart and mind of a person. Since spiritual purification involves the heart, ceremonial washings are ineffective and unnecessary in preventing spiritual defilement. Several Bible scholars recognize the error of interpreting this passage as an abrogation of the laws of clean and unclean meats. Certain grammatical factors as well as the context of scripture, determine how to properly translate verse 19. The Greek word translated purifying is a participle and must agree in grammatical gender with the noun it describes. Because this participle has a masculine ending, it cannot refer to stomach, which is in the feminine gender in Greek. Thus, many scholars instead relate purifying back to he said. However, another alternative provides a better explanation. The expression is eliminated in the New King James Version is a euphemistic rendering of what the original King James Version translates as goeth out into the draft. Draft is an archaic way to translate the Greek word aphidron, which means a place where the human waste discharges are dumped, a privy, sink, or toilet. Aphidron is a masculine gender noun, so purifying can refer to the end result of human waste, the toilet. The commentary on the New Testament interpretation of Mark explains the passage on the basis of this pertinent information. The translation, this he said, making all meats clean, makes the participle clause, purifying all foods, a remark by Mark, that Jesus makes all foods clean, a remark that we cannot accept. He is explaining to his disciples how no food defiles a man. As far as this thought is concerned, Jesus expresses it already in the preceding clause and goes out into the privy. What he now adds is that the privy, the end result of the digestive process, makes all food clean. For all foods have their course through the body only, never touch the heart, and thus end in the privy. Since the disciples are so dense, the Lord is compelled to give them so coarse an explanation. In this, however, he in no way abrogates the Levitical laws concerning foods. The Jewish New Testament commentary in its note on verse 19 summarizes well the overall meaning of this passage. Yeshua, Jesus, did not, as many suppose, abrogate the laws of Kashrut or kosher and thus declare ham kosher. Since the beginning of the chapter, the subject has been ritual purity and not Kashrut at all. There is not the slightest hint anywhere that foods in this verse can be anything other than what the Bible allows Jews to eat, in other words, kosher foods. Rather, Yeshua is continuing his discussion of spiritual prioritizing. He teaches that tohar, or purity, is not primarily ritual or physical, but spiritual, verses 14 to 23. On this ground, he does not entirely overrule the Pharisaic slash rabbinic elaborations of the laws of purity, but he does demote them to a subsidiary importance. This is confirmed by a passage in Luke suggested by a dear sister in the Lord, where Yeshua was invited to a dinner. This is taken from the New Living Translation for greater clarity. So Yeshua went in and took his place at the table. His host was amazed to see that Yeshua sat down to eat without first performing the hand-washing ceremony required by Jewish custom. Then Yeshua said to him, You Pharisees are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, Tameh full of greed and wickedness. Fools, didn't God make the inside as well as the outside? So clean the inside by giving gifts to the poor, and you will be clean all over. Now for the second article, Does Romans 14 abolish laws on unclean meats? Many believe Romans 14 says that Christians are free from all former restrictions regarding the meats they may eat. They cite as proof Romans 14.14, 14, in which Paul wrote, I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean of itself, but to him who considers anything to be unclean, to him it is unclean. 
This approach, however, fails to consider the context of Paul's letter as well as the specific Greek words he used. Many Bible resources agree that Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians around A.D. 55 and that he wrote his epistle to the Romans from Corinth in 56 or 57. The food controversy in Corinth, reflected in chapters 8 and 10, was over meat sacrificed to idols. Since Paul was writing to the Romans from Corinth, where this had been a significant issue, the subject was fresh on Paul's mind and is the logical, biblically supported basis for his comments in Romans 14. Understanding Paul's Intent those who assume the subject of Romans 14 is a retraction of God's law regarding clean and unclean animals must force this interpretation into the text because it has no biblical foundation. The chapter itself shows that the discussion concerned meat sacrificed to idols. Romans 14.2 contrasts the person who, quote, eats only vegetables, end quote, with the one who believes, quote, he may eat all things, end quote, meat as well as vegetables. Romans 14.6 discusses eating versus not eating and is variously interpreted as referring to fasting, not eating or drinking, vegetarianism, consuming only vegetables, or eating or not eating meat sacrificed to idols. Romans 14.21 shows that meat offered to idols was the underlying issue of this chapter. It is good neither to eat meat, nor drink wine, nor do anything by which your brother stumbles, or is offended, or is made weak. The Romans of the day commonly offered both meat and wine to idols, with portions of the offering later sold in the marketplace. The Life Application Bible comments on verse 2. The ancient system of sacrifice was at the center of the religious, social, and domestic life of the Roman world. After a sacrifice was presented to a god in a pagan temple, Temple. Only part of it was burned. The remainder was often sent to the market to be sold. Thus a Christian might easily, even unknowingly, buy such meat in the marketplace or eat it at the home of a friend. Should a Christian question the source of his meat? Some thought there was nothing wrong with eating meat that had been offered to idols because idols were worthless and phony. Others carefully checked the source of their meat or gave up meat altogether in order to avoid a guilty conscience. Paul explains in 1 Corinthians 8 that the main concern for a Christian is to not defile his own conscience or the the conscience of other Christians. Jewish Christians especially might have been inclined to feel contaminated by anything related to idolatry, but because an idol cannot, by itself, render anything pure or defiled, a person's conscience, not the idol, is the real issue. So what is the point of Paul's instruction about eating or not eating in Romans 14? Depending on their consciences, early believers had several choices. Those wishing to be sure of avoiding meat sacrificed to idols could choose to eat only vegetables or fast, avoid food altogether when faced with the prospect of consuming foods of suspicious background. For those whose consciences were not troubled by eating meat purchased in local markets just because it might have been ceremonially offered to idols, that option was open to them with one important restriction. They were, especially at group meals where offenses were more likely to occur, to consider first the conscience of others who were present, to be careful to give no offense. Within this context, said Paul, let each be fully convinced in his own mind, Romans 14.5, because whatever is not from faith is sin, Romans 14.23. Greek words clarify Paul's meaning. An understanding of the Greek words Paul used can also help us understand Paul's meaning. The New Testament writers referred to two concepts of unclean using different Greek words to convey the two meanings. Unclean could refer to animals God did not intend to be consumed as food, listed in Leviticus 11 and Deuteronomy 14. Unclean could also refer to ceremonial uncleanness. In Romans 14, Paul uses the word koinos, which means common. In addition to the meanings of common and ordinary, see Acts 2.44, Acts 4.32, Titus 1.4, and Hebrews 10.29, the word also applied to things considered polluted or defiled. This word, along with its verb form, Renew is used in Mark 7 2, Mark 7 15 to 23, where it obviously refers to ceremonial uncleanness. Koinos and koinu appear throughout the New Testament to refer to this kind of ceremonial uncleanness. Something could be common, ceremonially unclean, even though it was otherwise considered a scripturally clean meat. An entirely different word, akathartos, is used in the New Testament for those animal scriptures specified as unclean. Both words, koinos and akathartos, are used in Acts 10, where Peter distinguished between the two concepts of uncleanness by using both words in Acts 10.14. When Paul said in Romans 14.14 14, that I know and am convinced by the Lord Jesus that there is nothing unclean, koinos, or common of itself, he was making the same point he had made earlier to the Corinthians. Just because meat that was otherwise lawful to eat may have been associated with idol worship does not mean it is no longer fit for human consumption. As seen from the context, Paul wasn't discussing biblical dietary restrictions at all. 
Paul goes on to state in Romans 14.20 that, quote, all food is clean, NIV. The word translated clean is katharos, meaning free from impure admixture, without blemish, spotless. Clean meats as such aren't addressed in the New Testament, so there isn't a specific word to describe them. Catharsis is used to describe all kinds of cleanliness and purity, including clean dishes, Matthew 23:26, people, John 13:10, and clothing, Revelation 15:6, Revelation 19:8-14, pure religion, James 1:27, and gold and glass, Revelation 21:18. Realize also that in Romans 14.14 14 and Romans 14.20, the word food or meat doesn't appear in the original Greek, but was inserted by later translators. No specific object is mentioned relative to cleanness or uncleanness. The sense of these verses is merely that nothing is unclean, koinos, common or ceremonially defiled, of itself, and all is clean, katharos, free from impure admixture, without blemish, spotless. Paul's point is that association of food with idolatrous activity had no bearing on whether the food was inherently suitable or unsuitable for eating. Understood in its context, Roman 14 does not convey permission to ignore the biblical laws as to which meats are clean or unclean. Now we come to a part where we discuss some of the controversies and questions people may have about this topic. You may ask, what about those who came before me and ate pork and shellfish? Are they doomed to eternity without God? What if pork is the only meat I can afford? And so on. Of course we do not know for sure because we are not in the place of God. Only he knows for sure. All we can do is present the scriptures and let each person work out their salvation with the Lord. Each of us will appear before his judgment seat to give an account. 2 Corinthians 5.10 In the defense of those who eat to may meat out of necessity, whether there is a famine and there is nothing else to eat, or if a person is in desperate need of animal protein and there is not another option available, the Lord means his Torah to be for life, not for death. If it is a choice between eating a pig or a human being, we believe the Lord would choose the former. That is actually confirmed by Pekua Nefesh, the principle in Jewish law that the preservation of human life overrides virtually any other religious rule. Now, if it is not to save a life, again, it is between you and God. Furthermore, there are some scriptures that state if someone inadvertently eats or touches something to may or unclean, that person must wash and will be unclean until evening, then they will be clean again. That's in Leviticus 11, 39-40 and 17, 15. However, these verses may only apply to eating to whore or clean animals that died on their own or that were torn by animals or by touching the carcasses of tahor or clean animals, perhaps not the purposeful eating of tamay or unclean animals. In the defense of those who eat tamay meat unintentionally, like at the home of a friend who may not know your dietary restrictions, or people who are or were not aware that this is not permitted by the Lord, if it is accidental, unintentional, and not willfully done, we believe the Lord is merciful. But there is a passage in Isaiah that actually appears to be saying that the intentional eating of tamay or unclean animals is rebellion against him, as is the sin by idolatry. Tree. Isaiah 66, 14b to 24, JPS version. And the hand of the Lord shall be known toward his servants, and he will have indignation against his enemies. For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and his chariots shall be like the whirlwind, to render his anger with fury, and his rebuke with flames of fire. For by fire will the Lord contend, and by his sword will all flesh, and the slain of the Lord shall be many. They that sanctify themselves and purify themselves to go unto the gardens, behind one in the midst, eating swine's flesh, and the detestable thing and the mouth shall be consumed together, saith the Lord. For I know their works and their thoughts. The time cometh that I will gather all nations and tongues, and they shall come and see my glory. And I will work a sign among them, and I will send such an escape of them unto the nations, and they shall declare my glory among the nations. And they shall bring all your brethren out of all the nations for an offering unto the Lord, to my holy mountain Jerusalem, saith the Lord, as the children of Israel bring their offering in a clean vessel into the house of the Lord. And of them also will I take for the priests and for the Levites, saith the Lord. For as the new heavens and the new earth which I will make shall remain before me, saith the Lord, so shall your seed and your name remain. And it shall come to pass that from one new moon to another and from one Sabbath to another shall all flesh come to worship before me, saith the Lord. And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have rebelled against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. In closing, there is one more scripture that I would like to share, and it comes from Ezekiel chapter 44, where in Ezekiel's temple, which many believe will be made manifest in the millennial kingdom, which will most likely be in the future. Ezekiel 44, 23, The priest shall teach my people the difference between the holy and the unholy, and cause them to discern between the unclean, tame, and the clean, tahor. As the Lord's priest, may we all discern the Lord's will. I pray this study has been edifying and a blessing to you. Closing prayer.
Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing everyone to be a part of this study, as well as your kingdom, through the sacrifice of your Son, Yeshua, for salvation. May you bless and keep each one, enriching them and their families every day, as they and all of us study your word together, love one another, and seek to obey you as your body, your bride, your temple, and your family. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Numbers 6, 24 to 26. How sweet are your words to my taste. Yes, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Psalm 119, 103. Shalom, everyone. God bless.